Kia ora. Welcome, Dr. Rod Carr. Uh, the Commissioner for the Environment, Simon Upton, he said we can't plant our way out of this climate crisis. Do, do you agree with that? And what does that actually mean? I, I, I think the Parliamentary Commissioner for the Environment is absolutely correct. So let's just think about what's going on. At the moment, when you or I um, undertake an action that releases a tonne of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, about 60% of that carbon dioxide breaks down in the atmosphere in the first 100 years. But 20% of it is still there, adding a warming effect to the planet 10,000 years later. What the offsetting with forestry claims to do is to go, you know, if we plant a tree and it sucks some carbon out of the air that would not otherwise have been sucked out, that, quote, offsets my emission. Now, that is true to some extent. And it's true to the extent that that forest stays there for as long as the carbon dioxide stays in the air. In other words, most of it's got to stay there for centuries to come. And in a changing climate where you can't enforce laws beyond the grave, the real risk is that it is not a one-for-one -one trade off. So that's the first problem with the idea I can pollute and plant my way out of this. You can't. And the second thing is that that emission I made today requires that forest to be in place, storing that carbon offset. And then when you make your emission, there's another piece of land that has to be given to a new tree to offset that emission. Ultimately, you can't plant your way out of this because you run out of plantable land. We have to reduce gross emissions of the greenhouse gases that are causing climate change. All that said, we still need to meet our short-term objectives like our 2030 targets. What role could exotic forests play in meeting those objectives? Well, the first thing is a tree planted today will do nothing for you by 2030. Right? The amount of carbon sequestered in a newly planted tree, even a fast-growing pine tree in seven years, is minimal. So what planting trees today is, it helps you offset your emissions between 2035 and 2050, right? You buy time in that window, but you give up land use for centuries to come because now it has to be maintained as a forest of that type. Rotational plantation forests do have a part to play in our bioeconomy of the future and forever, but the native forests of mixed age, mixed species, and often indigenous in their location and specificities, those are the forests which will provide offsets to, for the hard to abate emissions to keep us at net zero in the second half of the century. We're planting and maintaining those native forests so our children and grandchildren cannot contribute to global warming, but still have some emissions from the way of life they'll live at the time. You've expressed concerns about the long-term consequences of exotic permanent forests. Can you explain what you mean by that concern? Well, I, I think that if, if we define what has come to be understood by an exotic permanent forest, it's a forest where essentially the NZUs and the emission trading scheme, the units that are given, are taken by the original planter of that forest and are sufficient in quantity and value that they justify the purchase of the land, the planting of the trees, and they don't need to be harvested in the future because enough money has been paid in the present to basically allow that first rotation to wash its face and that planter to take the money and run away. Now, in 100, 150 years' time, that Pinus radiata forest of the same age planting will begin to die naturally they begin to die. But because it was all planted at the same time and because it was densely packed to get the maximum credits, there isn't an understory that can develop a replacement forest. And in the absence of the replacement forest, age, disease, fire and storm, with nobody responsible for funding the replacement of the forest to maintain the carbon store, means that it is a fiction to believe that that is truly an offset to the emissions that were made at the time for which the units were being used and surrendered. So, so essentially we have got a hole in our emissions trading scheme which allows gross emissions to be higher because emissions are underpriced relative to the overvalued sequestration going on in same age, same species, 
monocultures. If you think about the nature of the problem definition, which is we don't have control of the number of forestry units entering the emissions trading scheme, and we may not be able to compensate for all those that are entering by stopping auctioning new ones. There may still be a flood of these new things coming in, which keeps the rewards for reducing gross emissions lower than they should be or need to be. So the rewards for new technologies for reducing emissions from energy production or the new technologies to swap out um, high emitting fuel sources and low and medium temperature process heat. Um, they're not adequately or as adequately rewarded, rewarded, so they don't happen at scale and pace the way they would if they were rewarded better. So that makes policy setting really difficult, doesn't it? And so what is your advice then about the balance for these permanent exotic forests? Well, I think in terms of the architecture of the ETS, we're going to have to have a sensible conversation about how many forestry units is in New Zealand's economic, social and cultural interest to allow to be credited into the emissions trading scheme and is a free-for-all for anybody who buys land and plants a tree gets the credit is that the best and optimal outcome? And then secondly, we've got the issue is that the carbon sequestration in natives doesn't entirely represent the true value of natives to New Zealand society and culture. So is there the need for additional public funding or subsidy to support the establishment and the protection of native forests? Climate change is going to affect everyone and nobody wants this. Can you just talk about the psychology of, of that and you know how do we have to adjust our mindset? So the, the, the challenge is at the moment a lot of the conversation in New Zealand is about mitigation, about reducing our emissions, gross emissions, more sequestration, reduction in net emissions, meeting domestic targets, fulfilling international obligations, and there's all the debate about, about mitigation. And it is true that, that New Zealand's contribution to the 55 billion tonnes of greenhouse gases emitted every year is marginal or trivial at best. My view is the reason we want to adopt low emission practices, both in terms of how we produce and use energy, how we get around, and how we produce meat and milk protein, is that low emissions products and services are going to be more valued and less vulnerable by the middle of the century, that low emission lifestyles are going to be relatively more affordable compared to high emitting lifestyles, and low emitting livelihoods are going to be less disrupted than livelihoods based on high emitting businesses, whether it's agriculture, or industry, or otherwise. So, so it's in our own self-interest to get these low emitting practices and technologies deployed in New Zealand, not just because it might help the world, mainly because it'll help us. But all that aside, adaptation is real. Whatever happens now, it looks like we are going to pass 1.5 degrees global warming by mid-century and certainly heading towards 2 degrees this century. So from that point of view, a warmer, wetter, windier, drier New Zealand is coming to us. And one of the biggest impacts will be on agriculture. And around the world, those impacts will cause an increase in the application of capital and technology for controlled growing environments for both animals and crops, because the risks of growing out in the wide open are going to go up dramatically. And increasingly, insurers won't provide cover, banks won't provide lending, uh, and you'll, you'll have to get into the sort of covered crop, controlled growing environment way of getting this done. The reason we need to do this is not to bully farmers or blame them or shame them, it's to create a system that rewards them. And one of the least cost ways of signaling rewards is through price. What Haywalker Ekanoa have proposed is a pretty low price that looks closer to a levy or tax than a price, and then sort of good behaviour grants on the other side, which is interesting because mainly farmers don't want to have to apply for money, they want to earn it and be rewarded for doing the thing that has the least cost in terms of emissions and financial cost. So from that point of view, the Commission's view was that you needed a marginal price of emissions that would reward a lower emitting farm practice and lower emitting land uses. Um, and what is now proposed and probably likely to come about is a price that pays less of a part in emissions reduction, raises money, which is then used to fund the better practices on farm. Let's talk about the future. What does the future of a great New Zealand forest look like? 
I'll I tell you a little story because it is a personal story. So in, in 1983, uh, my wife and I and her stepbrother and partner bought 40 hectares of land in the foothills of the Tarawa Ranges on the Wainawa River. And at that time, the government was throwing money around to clear native bush, plant pine trees. So we cleared about 10 hectares of this 40 hair block and, and hand planted ourselves 20,000 pine trees, right? The kids have grown up in amongst those trees, in, in the lake, the river, you know, they've, they've had that lived experience. We've shared that experience with them. The really interesting thing is those kids, as far as they're concerned, they want the native bush to replace the pine trees. Sooner the pine trees are gone, the better, as far as they're concerned. They're not interested in the money, they just want the native bush to be where the pine trees are. So we are a living example of this watching the native seed source provide the understory to our widely spaced, poorly planted pine forest, right? And the evidence is it does happen, but it is 40 years in, I've got to say, there's not much native happening under the pine trees. This is clearly hundreds of years. This is not decades. So, so that's our lived experience. So what's my vision is that more New Zealanders could have access to New Zealand's native bush to walk through, to camp in, to take their friends and family and visitors through, and that they would respect it and protect it, not just because it's a carbon store and it stops the planet from warming, but because it is inherently part of what makes us the people we are. 